Well, welcome everyone to the February edition of the IPM Hour. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, today we have uh, two speakers joining us, uh, Pam Marone and, and Sonia Rios. Uh, Pam is, is going to speak first. She received her bachelor's degree from Cornell University and um, a doctorate degree from North Carolina State University, both in entomology. Uh, she led the insect biology group at uh, Monsanto. And Pam, correct me if I'm wrong, I count three startups. Is that you right? You got it. Three startups in Davis. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's AgriQuest, Entotech. And by the way, I should, should know, we used to get, when I was a postdoc here at Davis, we used to get our diamondback moths from Entotech. That's when, uh, it's quite a few years ago now. But. That's quite a few years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, and then uh, Marone Bioinnovations uh, most recently. She currently serves as the executive chairperson and partner of Primary BioAg Innovations and Global BioAg Linkages. Uh, these two uh, groups help innovators scale up their uh, bioagricultural and agricultural biotech companies, um, uh, businesses and, and help gain market adoption. And today she's gonna to talk about the use of biologicals in IPM. Great. Okay, I'll get my screen going here. All right. So, can you hear me okay? No problem? No problem. Okay, great. So today, as you know, in California, uh, there's many issues and just, a well, a lot of them on this this slide and it, it, it's never ending. We have a new administration in Washington now. So that means there's more scrutiny on chlorpyrifos and a number of the chemicals. And uh, in my world, I deal with investors and they're um, scrutinizing companies on what's called environmental, social and governance factors. And big food is, 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 is asking farmers to uh, measure their sustainability, and then the whole area of carbon footprint and um, climate smart farming is a big deal. Um, so uh, it's it's just always a dynamic time in this in, in in agriculture. So it behooves us to look at other tools of how to solve some of these problems besides the traditional ones. And the big companies um, had went through a bunch of mergers, and out came this list of the big six but it's shuffled, shuffled the, the deck chairs, a little different big six than you've seen in the past. UPL has catapulted up there. Um, and because of the low, the low growth of the, of the chemical uh, input segment, crop protection segment due to, well, I mean, low commodity prices until lately, you know, we've had some shoot up in corn and soybeans, but global regulatory restrictions, uh, you know, uh, Europe, Canada banned or restricted the neonics and so forth. And, constant, just something happening, even Mexico restricting glyphosate. Resistant, pest resistance is the real issue with, with many of the single site chemicals. It costs so much money now, which I'll show you in the next slide to develop a new chemical. So there's not a really huge pipeline of new active ingredients. So as a result, the big companies are rapidly moving into digital ag. Um, they're creating corporate venture capital funds and startup accelerators so they can get access to new innovations from startup companies. And I'll talk about some of those. Making acquisitions and doing things to increase their environmental, social, and governance scores with investors. So it just takes a lot of chemicals to find one new chemical that can meet all of today's uh, requirements for, for health and safety. So it's close to 300 million and takes 10 to 12 years to get a new chemical to market. So only the big behemoths can operate in this, this, uh, this area, but it, it's still difficult. As you can see from the, 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 the graph chart on the right, uh, there's, there's new leads of new chemicals uh, that are in the orange bars, but the green bars are the ones that are actually being launched. Now it looks like you know we're we're getting a little bit better than we're in the in the mid 2000s, but it's still low historically on the number of new agrochemicals being launched, new active ingredients. So the big companies have jumped into ag biologicals. Um, there are, are quite a number of deals. Two new ones: um, Amvac um, bought Agrinos, a biostimulant company, late last year, and uh, 
Wow, a big, big um, announcement is that Syngenta bought a, the, la the largest biostimulant company, um, uh, Valagro, um, recently. So, some, so continuing to uh, make some acquisitions. And then there's some smaller companies doing deals. Uh, my own old company, I retired from Marone Bio August 2nd of last year. And uh, we, we bought Profarm, which was a bionutrient seed treatment company um, in Finland. And then a biopesticide company based on orange oil, Oroagri, uh, changed hands. Verdesian, biostimulant biopesticide company, was sold to a private, another private equity group. So on and on. So you'll see, you'll see the change of, of owners happening, uh, continuing with the industry. We expect this trend to continue um, so um, well through, through the next two years. As companies want to get access to these types of products and bring them into their portfolios, what are we talking about? The three types are biopesticides. In the US, that's the term. Generally, you see it outside the US called biocontrol. The industry is trying to change that from biopesticides to bioprotection, just like you know, agrochemicals are now cro called crop protection tools. Also included in the, this category of biopesticides are plant growth regulators. Why is that important? Because the EPA has just put out some guidance that says some biostimulants um, are actually bio, uh, they're actually plant growth regulators and must be regulated as biopesticides. So that was uh, late last year um, uh, was a, a notice that EPA put out. So the industry, our bio, uh, Products Industry Alliance and others are trying to sort through that and how um, we can have clear delineations between what would be registered as a biopesticide and what would a PGR versus a biostimulant. And so it all has to do with what claims you make um, in, uh, in that, and they've given some guidance on that. There's a very rapidly growing segment of bionutrients or biofertilizers, companies developing uh, microbes as well as genetically modified microbes like Pivot Bio to fix nitrogen. So this area is very hot. Regulators want to reduce the amount of nitrate and, uh, for, and phosphate runoff. So you're going to see a lot of activity in innovation in the bionutrient area, as well as all three of these, all very fast growing, way fast growing, more fast, fast growing than the chemical segment. The, the, uh, and the regulations for biostimulants are in flux and uh, still a patchwork of state regulations. We thought the 2018 Farm Bill was gonna fix that, but unfortunately uh, EPA jumped in. And so now um, th that's still in flux. So, so why the rapid growth of, the, uh, of, of these categories? Well, what, what uh, growers are finding is that when integrated, it's an integrated solution not standalone solutions, but integrated solutions. They're seeing better, better ROI, better quality, better nutrient density, better soil health. Um, a, a number of, of reasons why in integrated programs, they're seeing better, better results, which means a better ROI. Some of these things are, have not been measured like soil health or lower carbon footprint, but are being measured now. For example, growers are now asking us, um, the input suppliers, you know, what is the effect of your product on soil health? So there are companies that have popped up to measure that, uh, measure the nitrogen metabolism uh, before and after, the carbon fixation before and act after. What does it do to the microbiome, the microorganisms? Um, I'm working with a, um, a company that uh, uses manure to, uh, feeds manure to black soldier fly and they come up with a beautiful organic fertilizer. Very interestingly, the, uh, uh, the, the report we got from uh, one of the, these companies that does the soil health characterizations, biomakers in Davis, right in Davis, showed that we could increase beneficial fungi associated with biocontrol of nematodes. Who knew? You know, so this is quite an exciting thing where you're now being asked to look broader than just dead bugs or, uh, or leaf spot uh, and, and what is actually going on underneath our feet. Um, with uh, uh, you can sp spray in the field, be back in the field within a short period of time. This is really helpful with with tight labor markets. Spray right up to harvest. Don't have to worry about MRLs. Um, and and I did a I'm co uh, mentoring a company called Pheronim, which has a new form of pheromone 
uh, for um, nematode and insect control. And we interviewed as part of the National Science Foundation i program that uh, we were in, um, 100 plus growers as to what um, their needs were. And lo and behold, they said their current crop protection solutions were not completely adequate and they need better solutions for thrips, nematodes, bacterial diseases, and uh, uh, also nitrogen for organic farming. So a lot of still, still a lot of needs there. So what are we talking about? Um, there's two groups or branches at the Environmental Protection Agency that regulates. And then of course, CalDPR also does its own review, which takes uh, probably seven months to two years beyond the EPA. And California is the only state that requires efficacy data. So if you know that if it's registered in California, it, it is effective, the, these products are effective. So the, 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 back, the microorganisms can be dead or alive. If they're dead, that means that the metabolites like Marone bioproducts, Venerator, Grain Devo, insecticides, th that means that the metabolites produced by the microbes are delivering the efficacy, not the uh, bacteria, the, 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 they're not infecting and killing, it's the metabolites. So it's important to understand that. Also, um, Vesteron um, takes uh, spider venom peptides and, and, and uh, clones them into yeast cells and then um, uh, you know, kills the yeast and then you've got the peptide. So that would be another example of that. Now on the biochemical side, there's a lot of confusion about this category. I was on a Maroon Bio webinar last week and um, one of the PCAs was commenting in the chat and said, oh, um, something about spinosad being a biopesticide. And I said, well, actually spinosads, the spinosads are not biopesticides, they're registered as chemicals. Why is that? Not everything that is natural is registered as a biopesticide. You have to go to the EPA with, through the Biopesticide Classification Committee and get it to be declared to be a biopesticide, which is the lowest risk category. If it has a non-toxic mode of action to the pest or plant pathogen, it's a biopesticide, biochemical. If it has a toxic mode of action, it is then has to be registered as a chemical. So what, what does that mean? That means that if it has a mode of action that works on a pathway in the insect, that is a similar pathway in a mammal. For example, uh, pyrethrums work on a sodium channel in, in both animals, in both uh, mammals and insects. Spinosids and abamectin work on the GABA pathway in different ways. That's a nervous, path, nervous system pathway. So the EPA calls that a toxic mode of action to the past and hence regulated as a chemical. So spinosids, even though there's, and, and py pyrethrums, even though they have organic formulations because they're natural and they don't have any synthetics in them, they are not biopesticides. And it's important to understand that category. There are some other risks uh, with, with, the, with these products uh, compared to, to um, no, uh, biopesticides. So another thing it's important for pest management practitioners to understand is that, and I hear this a, a lot, uh, there's confusion in the field, when a small company launches a biopesticide after they've done a development for a few years, because you can get a product to market for a short period of, much shorter period of time and much less capital, there aren't the thousands and thousands of field trials, um, perfection done in the 300 million in by the time a biopesticide hits to market. So there's version 1.0, version 2.0, version 3.0. So the company is going to continue to launch new products in a rapid succession, uh, which are new and improved from the original one. And so it's very different where you go big, launch big globally of the big companies and have thousands of field trials. You might only have a hundred field trials behind your innovation if you're a biopesticide. So um, that's impor important to understand that um, uh, very important to understand that because um, uh, uh, the, the, I, like I'll hear a, a somebody who tested one of my own bioproducts five years ago and say, oh, I bet you're going to say that it's better now. And I go, yeah. He says, it didn't work very well back then. And I said, it's a very different product today. And um, it's extremely different in that, um, in that we would have spent quite a number of uh, people um, in the Davis lab developing uh, improved fermentation processes, improved formulations, in, uh, and um, understanding more the mode of action, how to target it better, what the better what the application volume is. 
um, and how best to use it during those five years so that there, the, each version is a different version of itself. So just because something was tested th even three years ago or five years ago does not mean it's the same product. And this is not an excuse at all for maybe less performance five years ago. It is simply a matter of the fact that these are living organisms that we can improve and constantly improve, increase the yields, increase their potency, incre improve their formulations, um, and how to and learn how to use them as we understand the mode of action, because these are very complex modes of action typically, which is great for resistance management. Um, and can be rotated or mixed with chemicals for resistance management. So understanding that then means um, we, we have uh, to keep up on, on what are the improvements in each product version to deliver a better product at a lower cost over time. So now I'm going to talk about some of the latest innovations of, of companies out there. It's never, it's a constant stream of companies starting up with lots of money going into this. Terramera has who, who would have thought there'd be innovations in neem? Well, uh, Terra Mara came up with a better um, formulation for cold press neem. I hear it's a very good product. Um, I'm, I'm hearing good reports from it in the field. And then um, Vesteron, as I mentioned, has um, uh, spider venom peptides that are um, expressed in yeast cells and then harvested for both sucking and chewing insects. And they combine for the LEPs, they combine it with a little bit of BT to derive it into the uh, cells. They're very good as uh, sucking insects, uh, for sucking insects on the, they're very good. And uh, I've seen the data and it's respectable data uh, from, from on these products. Um, Agrogene in, in San Diego is, is, is licensed some technology from the University UC, UC to make um, sterile spotted wing Drosophila and uh, to, to release flies, uh, engineer, engineered flies. Well, they're actually gene modified flies, gene edited flies. This is going to be a breakthrough, huge breakthrough to, to reduce the, 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 quite the number of sprays that are used now and very poor control of any tools right now for spotted wing Drosophila. Um, and uh, Greenlight Biosciences is using what's called RNAi. And um, they're, they're, this is a way to very precisely control one type of pest at a time, specifically um, uh, uh, with, a, with this new technology. And um, they've got a lot of money to do it. In biosciences licensed, you see Riverside um, uh, peptide from us, Australian um, citrus here shown in the finger, finger lime thing, uh, cit citrus. And uh, it's a peptide that dramatically um, can help on the citrus greening. It attacks the, the bacteria that that uh, causes citrus greening. So some exciting innovations. Pheromone technology. Again, you think pheromone technology is standstill. It's not. Well, Pheronim and Davis here is discovered a um, nematode pheromones that you apply with beneficial nematodes and you can dramatically um, drive those nematodes to lower, in, uh, uh, deeper into the soil, even deeper than where chemicals go and at much broader temperature ranges. So they've had very good data at how to, how they can improve dramatically um, the, the control. And they also found that these, um, they, can, they can find nematode pheromones for plant parasitic nematodes. That's further out, but they're also gonna have some very exciting technology for plant parasitic nematode control as well with these water soluble pheromones. They're not volatile pheromones, but water soluble pheromones. ProVV has, um, has is, and M2I are devel developing much less expensive caterpillar pheromones and uh, coming to market with some of those. So what else needs to happen to further drive biologicals into biointensive IPM? Innovation and in new products is one thing, but there are other products out there there's definitely more education and training needed. I've, I've done many surveys, growers and PCAs, and a, still a significant percentage don't really even understand the whole category. What are biologicals? What do they do? How to use them based on their unique mode of action? And it's really important to remember that most, if not all, are preventative products, not curative. So timing is critical. So um, we think that uh, you know, making proficiency in biologicals should be part of any uh, cooperative extension job these days because this category is becoming mainstream. 
um, especially now with the with the benefits to soil and plant health. And add we're you know we're working with DPR to add more ecologically based IPM um, to the PCA CCA uh, CCA and other states PCA licensing requirements, which we think will go a long way. But really, it's really important to go beyond counting bugs. I continue to see standalone trials side by side, best chemical against a biological, um, and then a percentage bug kill. That is only one metric, but it's not the whole story. Because of their unique modes of action, you really need to take them to marketable yields and quality. And I'm even hearing folks asking me, well, what about the nutrient density? It's not all about yields anymore. True. And so what we're seeing is that even if there's um, fewer bugs killed, the marketable yields and quality may be the same or better than chemical programs. Really important point, both on the disease control as well as the insect control side. Because of the way they work, they have multi modes of action and may affect the whole uh, season long control as well as plant health and soil health, which changes the plant and uh, makes it more, um, uh, more resistant to the bugs. And therefore, um, it's not just about counting them. Um, so you need the whole picture. And always the trials should be looked at in integrated programs. And I'm seeing that a lot more. I recently saw um, a, uh, an article where, where um, someone back east published uh, um, their integrated programs. They were integrating some biologicals with chemicals. And, um, but the tone of it was that, well, I integrated the biological and it didn't improve the program at all. It was just the same as the chemicals alone. And I said, well, hey, you've got if, you, if that's the case, then you've got resistance management, you've got uh, residue management, short, shorter re-entry, you've got all of these other benefits. So even if it's the same, there's benefits to integrating in the biological. And then larger block trials we're seeing are, are much better than small, small plots for um, these types of products, especially if you're taking them to yield. So, so, you know, many of the IPM programs, you build up the insects and then knock them down after, uh, after you get to it, uh, before you get to an economic injury level. That, that, those are not necessarily great for some of these new products because some of these products are, are more preventative and, and will stop them from re the bugs from reproducing, like Grain Devo, it's a repellent and stops re from reproduction. There is no knockdown effect. So it has no, it's not gonna have a good effect if you build the populations up and then knock them down, but getting them early before the pests build up, great product. So it's really under, uh, to, uh, important to understand. Farmers still expecting the next silver bullet, whether it's a chemical or biological, you know, that, that's, that's not where we're at today. And then holistic systems-based programs. And of course you see is, that's what you do. That's what you see IPM is about, um, it is really critical, but growers, frequently say they're given individual tools or individual pieces of knowledge, but they'd love to go beyond just pest management and have all of the, the tools they have, crop varieties, soil health practices, biological precision, now more and more precision tools, which I'll talk about in a minute, all integrated. And we'd love to see money back to the IR4 demo program, which really drove um, integrated programs on the farm with this money. Um, at the, given to the land grant uh, extension specialist to do trials. So I'm really uh, hoping that we can get some of that refunded. There's a explosion of precision tools that are now um, being available on the farm and the farmers are overwhelmed with, with the number of companies coming to them. That's why we have the Western Growers Center for Inter Innovation, which is helping vet companies and, and, uh, and for the farmers and, and um, uh, so, so they can, um, you know, find out which ones are really going to help them. But uh, what's really exciting is the convergence of precision tools with IPM. For example, there are um, there's a company called um, Root Applied Sciences, uh, spun out of um, Berkeley, that UC Berkeley, that is got real time. Uh, monitoring of spores so they can know they they can it's, you don't have to, to wait to find out when you have your spores in the field but they they have a, a, a can collect the spores and then tell you within some out just a few hours what uh spores you have this is going to dramatically change and improve the use of biologicals which are preventative products and by the time you find find out when that spore is a week has gone by and it's too late to apply um, this is this is really going to help. And then we have a number of 
automated traps that are connected to the internet. Um, Semios has done really well with combining precision tools and pheromones. Um, in, and you just you don't have to go out in the field and monitor anymore uh, physically. You just do it at your computer because the moths come into a, a, a trap. There's vision uh, camera in there, tells you how many moths you have, and then it automatically uh, puffs out the, the pheromone. At the same time, they, are, they have weather data and frost, frost data and water management data. So combining a, a total far, farm program for the grower. There's smart foam apps, there's um, uh, artificial intelligence powered uh, quality measurements, uh, a company like AgShift and our own uh, Christian Nansen from the Department of Entomology at UC Davis is, is developing a company to use hyperspectral imaging that can actually tell whether an insect is infected with a virus or whether a plant is infected with a fungus or has a, a, a early, very early when, when, a, when a, 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 an egg is laid. So very exciting uh, developments here that will be combined to make IPM more efficient. Soil health is very complex. I don't have time to go into it, but what we're understanding is there's all kinds of signaling of microbes to microbes and microbes to plants and, and companies and uh, IPM practitioners will be able to take advantage of this knowledge. For example, breeders have bred uh, soybeans to with a higher level of certain compounds that attract mycorrhizae fungus to the plant and then have shown that if you don't have these compounds, um, then you get, you get a, a weaker plant. So very exciting that you could actually now, and so breeders are now gonna have to look at not, uh, are they're gonna have to look at what var their varieties that they're doing in their breeding is going to do to attracting the, um, the, uh, the microbes or not. And then just to wrap up, um, so biologicals can address the macro issues that we're facing uh, with trying to reduce emissions on the farm and uh, global regula regulations and, and the food channel wanting more sustainability. Um, so uh, the, these, these, pro these products are here to stay and going, going mainstream. For more information, there's the Bioproducts, Biological Products Industry Alliance. Uh, which I started back as the Biopesticide Industry Alliance back in 2000. Um, it's now broadened and it has both biostimulants and biologicals, um, sorry, and um, uh, bpia.org. And then I did publish a paper, I can send a copy because there's this is a paid subscription. It's a little bit, it's actually already outdated. This, this industry is happening so quickly that um, changes are happening, but but it's still uh, a, a, the most comprehensive overview of uh, pesticidal natural products, how they're registered, how they're used, what are the what, you know, and and the technology behind it. And I'm happy to send somebody a uh, an ex copy of the paper if necessary. You can contact me at pamarone at gmail.com. Um, so thank you very much. Great, thanks, Pam. Um... I'm not seeing any questions yet in the chat. Are there, uh, if anybody has a question, just go ahead and unmute your microphone and you can pose your question now. We have a, we have a, we have a couple minutes for questions. So uh, if nobody asks a question, I will ask one. But... <laughs> I overwhelm them. No, not at all. I thought your your <laughs> talk was full of was very rich in information. So um, I guess not seeing a question, um, I'll go ahead and pose my question. Um, you know, where we've seen the most success has obviously been in the organic sector targeting insects. What what's really kind of preventing that? And and we've seen some successes with weeds too, um, some in the natural uh, systems less so in agricultural systems. In your opinion, what's really limiting the use of say biologicals uh, against, uh, you know, maybe some of our harder targets like uh, fusarium or verticillium or some of these, these fungi that are really, let's face it, they're really wreaking havoc in our agricultural systems. You know, I think it's just um, the, the companies that have products are largely small and they just don't have the funds to do all the testing that's required because I do know I'm seeing some products out there. Um, I, I focused on insect here, but I, sh I, sh I should have said 
Um, so Marone Bio was developing um, a biofumigant from a fungus called Muscoder albus that had some very, very, very good results on those, those pathogens. Uh, uh, Agbiome has howler, which is targeting some of those. I think it's just, it, it's a matter of time before I think the companies are aware that the fusarium and verticillium are the, are the big dogs in, in disease control and, and, and need solutions. But um, uh, the, it, it's just a, a matter of getting enough trials. These are expensive, tough trials to do um, and uh, getting the data to prove that they do work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in your opinion, it's really just a matter of time. It is, I, I, I'm seeing, I've seen several companies from Europe that I'm working with also um, with some data on, on those two major pathogens. And I'm excited that, uh, um, you know, they're, they're considering coming to the US, but then you're, you know, you're two years away, but there are registered products that um, where the company will be focusing on some other market, but they have data, they know that it might have those activities. There's some pretty decent um, efficacy with trichoderma um, on, uh, on these pathogens mm -hmm. and you, and combining in a program, um, uh, rather than standalone will, will be helpful. And I, and I think that's, what's needed is a, a real focus on an integrated program for those, those pathogens. Again, not looking at the sil silver bullet approach. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Pam. I'm, I'm not seeing any other questions. Are there any other questions for Pam? All righty, so then we will move along to Sonia Rios. Uh, Sonia completed her undergraduate and graduate work both in plant sciences at Cal Poly Pomona and California State University Fresno. Uh, since 2014, she has worked as the subtropical horticultural advisor in Southern California and much of her recent work has focused on avocado production in Southern California. And, that's what she's going to talk to us about today. So, Sonia, welcome. Hey, thank you so Matt. Um, thank you so much, Matt. Um, yes, yeah, so I have been working in this position now in Riverside and San Diego County for about almost about six and a half years now. Um, and um, I'm just going to jump straight to it because I only have like 25 minutes. Um, so. On these slides, I also put a little bit more so that this is being recorded, right? I believe so. Um, yes, it is. That, okay. Um, just so you guys can go back if needed to do it. So first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how big the California avocado production is. Um, California is the largest producer of avocados grown in the United States. Uh, the value of it is probably about $392 million. That was as of two. 2017. Um, there are more than 3,000 growers in California farming on approximately 50,000 acres. Um, and these are actually considered a specialty crop. Less than 1% of the state is suitable for growing them. Um, a healthy tree can produce up to 200 pounds of fresh fruit each year, which is approximately about 500 pieces. In 2018 alone, uh, California produced about 350 million pounds um, and they are not cheap to grow and usually go for a high premium price. Um, they also require a lot of water as well. So the avocado growers are faced with a lot of things. Um, they have to deal with weather. You know, we have um, we have our heat spells. We're in drought. Uh, there's fire, <laughs> uh, floods. Not so much. That's mostly in Florida. Um, but when it does rain, which it rarely does, it really rains. Um, so there's just so much water that the ground can get saturated. Um, but what they really have to worry about are invasive pests, and because um, most, well, not most, about 40, I believe about 40% of all the avocados that are grown in California are grown in San Diego County, which are right, which is right on the border of Mexico and where all the shipping docks are at. So if any invasive is gonna come in, it's gonna be, it's gonna be coming in from there. 
Um, so today I'm going to talk about three specific ones that um, one of them can potentially come to California. Um, another one that has been in California and is basically an update. And the third one um, was kind of um, only found in backyards and it's been spotty the last few years, um, but has really come up this past year. So the potential pest, this one's this one's pretty scary. Um, Florida is actually dealing with this right now. Um, I believe um, the red bay ambrosia beetle and the laurel wilt that comes along with it. Uh, Florida has been dealing with this, I believe, since 2012. Um, this complex was found originally in Georgia and I believe in 2004. So it's still fairly new within the United States. Um, this, um, this pest, the ambrosia beetle, um, is one of hundreds of, <laughs> hundreds of um, ambrosia beetles that can be found. Um, and luckily, it does not um, breed in avocado like another bug that I'm actually going to mention. Um, um, but it can bring one down fairly quickly. And it survives off of a fungus, which we call Laura Wilt. Raffaella is the name of the fungus. Um, it is a, a vascular disease. Um, and it's actually quite aggressive as well. Um, and Laura Wilt can be detected almost all over Florida, especially Southern Florida where the avocados are at. Um, however, here in California, it has not been found, the insect or the disease itself. Um, <clears throat> let me see here. Sorry, my screen's doing something weird. Um, okay. Um, okay. So the red, so the beetle itself can be attracted to trees by chemical cues um, that the tree emits when it's stressed out. Um, usually in nature, amb ambrosia beetles um, can actually help forests and help systems by bringing down the natural decay of a tree. But because of drought and um, and maybe sometimes growers aren't always on top of of their management practices, a tree can, can be susceptible to that. Um, they generally fly low and short distances. I believe they say that, um, I think they can travel up to 34 miles within a, a year. Um, most of the research that's being done for this complex is done by Jonathan Crane in Florida. Uh, he has a group of, I think about six or seven scientists that work with this. Um, so, you know, they've all been um, in their own specialties looking at exactly how this, um, how this beetle can bring down a tree. And um, when we're talking about the beetle itself, they can actually, um, they do most of their activity at dusk. Uh, usually there's no wind uh, during that time, so it helps them fly. So when it comes to symptoms, it's just like any other vascular disease. Um, you see the sectoral right over here. Um, and the fungus disrupts the vascular transport in water and nutrients by producing um, symptoms such as uh, branch dieback and may lead to tree death. And it does it fairly quickly. Um, it, here you have the wilting of the leaves and then you'll start seeing the, the, the brown leaves coming in because they're dying. And then you can, since it is in the vascular system, if you go, if you cut back into the cambium, you can actually see the streaking of the disease itself. Now the beetle, uh, the signs that you have the beetle, um, you'll actually see sawdust because remember they're boring um, beetles. So um, they bore their way into the tree. See all these little holes right here. Um, see right here too, is, they call it frass, I believe. 
Um, and then once the disease hits a tree, it can kill it fairly quickly. We're talking within weeks and months. Um, and if you don't act as a grower to try to contain where this disease is coming from, then you know, you're gonna start losing trees fairly quickly. And how this spreads, obviously you have the beetle itself that can, um, that can travel from tree to tree. Um, you also have um, people bringing down a dying tree, not knowing what killed it, chopping it into pieces and then selling it as, as fuel for fire. And, and the wood can still contain the fungus and the beetle as well. So you can actually uh, distribute it to different parts of the county, different parts of the state without even knowing it. Um, and it can also spread by root grafts. So usually when one tree is infected, when they tell you to treat it, they actually tell you to remove the surrounding trees as well because the avocado roots um, are, are fairly shallow and they actually touch each other from tree to tree and, um, and the disease can actually hop over from one tree to the next um, within the um, root system. In Florida, because we don't have it here, um, they've been doing a lot of different measures. And basically the first thing that they're doing right now is just remove the tree. And when you remove the tree, I'm not saying just stump it, you have to rip up the entire system, including the root system. And they've gotten better with their techniques and um, this can be pretty expensive. And, um, and what they found out, um, these numbers were from 2017. So um, the prices may be a little bit higher now, but in Florida, um, but in Florida, the best method is to actually knock over the tree and then grind it right there and then. You do not want to take any infected wood out of the grove. And um, pretty much, um, I know, um, we were talking about this um, with Jonathan Crane from Florida that once the beetle is in the tree, most likely you're not gonna be able to take it out. Um, and when you try to control it with insecticides, because they are inside the tree, um, insecticides usually don't work because they don't touch the beetle itself. Um, <clears throat> And so the first line of defense for this complex is basically you wanna keep your trees as healthy as possible. Cause remember they are attracted to weak dying sick trees. Um, you want to um, mitigate potential causes for tree decline, you know, um, which is uh, you, you don't want your trees to have signs of phytophthora. Um, you wanna make sure that they're fertilized correctly. Um, if there's a freeze, uh, you want to take care of that. If there's a heat wave, wind, whatever the situation is, just make sure your, um, your trees have a fighting chance. Um, then you want to make environment, the environment less uh, suitable for, for the beetle. Um, and this usually, I believe when Jonathan Crane from Florida was talking about what they've been doing to control measures, if you suspect it or just to prevent it, is that you want to prune late fall or winter when the activity is low, because the warmer it is, the more active they are. And you want to do it in the early morning, because remember, they like the late afternoon as the sun is setting. And then from there, you put on a contact herbicide, um, herbicide insecticide, and, um, and that's probably like the best way to treat. And um, currently, like I said, I only have about 20 minutes or so, but um, they have a whole list of insecticides that they are working with and testing um, various methods on how to apply it to the tree. And like I said, the biggest thing also is sanitation. Um, you wanna chip or burn. Uh, I think most of the growers in Florida are burning the trees um, on their property. 
Um, they are doing research like solarization by like bagging. Um, we're also doing that in California with the shot hole bore, which I'll get to right now. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of things that are happening right now. So when it comes to regula regulatory control, uh, most of the time you just want to re uh, remove the infested, um, the removal of infested unmanaged groves. Uh, they can be a reservoir for that. And then what can be done? Um, like I said, we have, uh, they're doing uh, area-wide um, management um, planning. Um, they're looking into different strains of um, pathogens <clears throat> that, can, um, that can go for the beetle. Um, more biocontrol agents. Um, identify tactics that can control the beetle inside the trees, and then um, continue with the attractants and repellents. And when I went to Florida in 2016 to see this for myself, it's really devastating. It's pretty scary once you get to see what it's capable of doing. And what they're doing right now is uh, scouting for it, and they're using drones now for that. And they also have uh, um, disease sniffing dogs. I believe I think there's five of them right now within the state, but you know how that can only do so much. But the dogs, we saw them working and they're right on target. They're really, really, um, they're really good at what they do. Um, so, you know, they've been being creative with all the ways that they can um, try to control this. So update on our current pest, another ambrosia beetle. <laughs> we have the polyphagous shot hole four. Um, it's also an invasive ambrosia beetle from Southwest, Southeast Asia that was first detected in Los Angeles County in 2003. Um, the Shaho boar is a pest of great concern, especially in Southern California. It can attack over 300 different tree species. Um, when I first started in 2014, we were at only about 100 Um about a hundred trees that it can attack. And then just a few years ago, it was 200. And I just, when I was doing this, when I was putting together this talk, now it's at 300. Um, and, um, and, and because of this, um, we're really scared that it's going to basically eliminate some species of trees within California, uh, we have our native oaks, maple, um, maples, sycamores, willows. Um, and then of course the avocado is always a great concern for that as well. And as you guys can see, these guys are tiny little things. Um, so if you're not really trained to see them or look out for them, um, you might miss them. So like I mentioned before, there is a complex system with these guys um, as well. Um, they, they come with a fungus, pretty much, um, that causes fusarium dieback. Um, this fungus, it disrupts the vascular transport of water and nutrients, uh, very similar to the ambrosia beetle. Um, and um, the symptoms such as branch dieback may lead to, may lead to tree death. Um, I think that's probably a major difference between this complex and the one in Florida. The one in Florida, once the tree gets it, it's almost guaranteed it's going to die within weeks or months. Um, for this one, um, the tree may hang on a little bit longer. It takes a little bit longer for the tree to go down for that. And with this beetle, it only breeds in certain species of trees. And as of right now, um, we have yet to see a tree, wait, we have yet to see an avocado tree die from this fusarium complex. Um, however, in Israel, um, you can even talk to Mary Lurapea, she's a UC specialist. Uh, she went to Israel and those growers are claiming that the shot hole bore can and has killed avocado trees. And so we're kind of in a toss up. So we have what, you know, I don't know what the conditions are in the different country. I don't know their um, cultivation practices, 
Um, but here in California, it's actually, um, we're not as in a panic as we were around 2013 and 14, because we've yet to see them die from that. <clears throat> and the, this, um, this, this, this fungus can, or this fungi can actually, um, a lot of people can misdiagnose it. They, um, it looks very similar to Phytophthora. Um, and um, it's, since it is a slow decline, if it is um, in a tree that it doesn't breed in, um, then it can get misdiagnosed. But in avocado, here are the major symptoms. So you'll start seeing the dye back randomly set around the tree. A lot of people can mistake this for wind damage, drought, um, salinity, um, <clears throat> and most people just, okay, well, it's just wind damage because this is on the border of the grove. Well, if you start finding this type of damage in the middle of the grove, you obviously know that it's not going to be wind damage. Um, and then the, the major sign where we usually can tell without even um, finding the beetle are these white sugary um, volcanoes, I guess you can call them. And they're basically wounds and it's the sugar coming up um, from the xylem and um, it's fighting the infection. However, sometimes you don't see this because this can be washed away with rain. Um, so if you start seeing some of this, but not this, you know, you, know, you kind of have to keep an eye out for all the different things. And also um, you can also see the staining within um, the vascular system, very similar uh, to the lower wilt. Um, so those are like the major signs that you can find it in the avocado. Um, for the life cycle of the actual beetle, um, 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 when, if, when a female uh, beetle um, excavates a gallery and inoculates the gallery walls, um, it spreads out this, um, these fungal spores. Um, and from there, the female and her off offspring feed off of that fungus that she created. And uh, when she lays her eggs there, she actually lays them at different times um, so that there can be different generations to make sure that the population is successful. And basically, um, most of the um, most of the um, offspring are female. A big majority of them are. There may be only a handful of male, and that is because what's happened is that when they're in um, when they are inside the gallery, the males, the brothers, actually mate with his sisters so that they can reproduce. So by the time the female actually leaves the tree to go find her own tree, she's actually already pregnant, um, searching for a tree to start her own gallery system. Um, when it comes to their life cycle, um, like I mentioned before, the females leave um, pregnant so they can start the cycle all over again. Um, uh, usually the males just stay put. They actually don't have wings, um, just the females do. And they do not um, possess, they don't, they do not possess the mycongia for fungus storage. Um, um, so when it comes to trying to um, control during this life cycle, it doesn't work. Um, like for instance, they've tried mating disrupt disruption and that surely doesn't work. Um, so they're getting pretty expensive on how they're trying to be able to control this. Um, just to show you, the females are obviously larger than the males. Um, as you see here, they're still tiny regardless whether the male or female. Um, usually most of the time when you're scouting and you look and you look through uh, one of the little holes that they bore into, sometimes you might see the tail end of a female. And as soon as they know you're there or they, or they see the shadow of you there, they'll actually go into their tunnel. They're very hard to catch. <laughs> um, and then we got a surprise 
that there's actually two species of shot hole boar that we were dealing with in California, not just one. Um, we have the Crocio shot hole boar, um, which was discovered in 2000, they suspect it came in 2013. Um, and they suspect it came in from the San Diego region. And it has now spread to Orange and Los Angeles and Santa Barbara counties. And the only way that you could tell the difference is if it's done through its DNA. Um, if you put them side by side together, they look exactly the same. So technically we had two in two different invasions because um, the polyphagous shot hole bore um, was mostly found near like Ventura, Santa Barbara, um, whereas the Crocio started down in San Diego. So for years, we didn't know that we actually had two different species of, um, of boars. And now we're thinking, okay, what can be done? Um, pesticides are limited, um, kind of like the same as the other ambrosia beetle from Florida. Um, they're basically, you want to take care of um, sanitation and make sure your cultural practices um, are up to date. And uh, there's been a lot of testing down at UCR. We have uh, Richard Stoutmeyer, uh, we have Timothy Payne, Akif Escalon. Um, they've all been working with this, um, with, with the shot hole bore since it first came to California. And what they found out was that yes, you can use um, bags once the wood is chopped chopped up, once you bring down the dead tree or dying tree, um, you want to wrap it in plastic. However, they noticed that the clear plastic did not work as well as the black plastic. Um, so leaving it out in the hot summer, um, summer heat will actually do the job. Um, and then also chipping it. You want to chip it less than an inch, about an inch. Um, that's the only way that you'll know that you'll get rid of the, um, get rid of the beetle itself. Um, and then avoid moving wood. Um, just maybe a couple years ago, um, I lived down near, um, Temecula, which is, you know, close to San Diego County. And I saw a truck with chopped up wood, which was avocado wood. And it was up in Big Bear. <laughs> So a guy was selling firewood was, that was cut from trees in an infested um, grove, probably. And that's most likely how it's spreading so quickly throughout California is through the firewood. Um, as of right now, uh, there's no specific um, pheromones known for these two beetles. Um, I'm just going to skip by really quick. Um, Okay, um, yeah, so um, there's, um, for, so the best management practices is pretty much, you know, you don't want it, so you want to basically prevent it. Um, there are still a lot of scouting going on. Uh, the UC, CDFA, um, Act Commissioners in San Diego, Riverside, and Santa Barbara, Ventura, San Luis Obispo, uh, they are all um, still monitoring um, this pest. Like I said, in the avocado world, we're not as stressed as we used to be um, because we, so far, like I said, no trees have died in the avocado sector. However, when it comes to all the other 300 species in California trees, uh, that can be a bit worrisome. Um, so we wanna make sure that uh, we don't contribute to the increase of that um, beetle population. Okay, currently yes, becoming a problem. Um, I'm gonna go through this super fast. So pretty much the avocado lace bug was first detected in San Diego in 2004. That was the very first time that we've ever seen this bug before. Um, and- uh, yes, Sonia? Yes. Yes. Um, so we are right up against one o'clock. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering if maybe we could leave the lace bug story for a next installment of the IPM hour since since we are kind of right up against it now. 
Oh yeah, that's actually a Do good you think idea. That might be possible that we have you back and to talk about. That? Yeah, I mean, I thought what you were presenting was great, and I would love to hear the lace bug story. But but, you know, there there are probably going to be people who are going to start to drop off since we're we're at one o'clock now. Yeah, that's actually perfect. Is, is that okay? Yeah, no, that's fine. I can totally be okay. back for that. Um, yeah, like I said, the 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 beetle and fusterium complex can get kind of complicated, you know, because there's one that we have and the one that we don't have, and I have to remember which is which. But um, but I'm glad that we're able to at least get those two out. Great, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat currently. Uh, is there someone who has a question that they might like to pose to Sonia? before we sign off today. Otherwise, I, of course, have a question, but <laughs> <laughs> but well, I can always pose this to you later, too, since we are running a little long. Maybe maybe I'll just pose my question to you in, in by email, Sonia. I do have a couple of questions that I would like to okay. ask you. But just in the interest of time, maybe it's best that we sign off. OK. Um, so, uh, I'd like to thank both. Yeah, I'd like to thank both our speakers, Pam and, and Sonia, for for speaking today. Those were really terrific. Um, I would like to invite everyone to the March IPM hour. Uh, let's see, March tenth. That's going to be the second. March tenth. March tenth is our next. Yeah, is our next installment of the IPM hour. So I uh, look for the newsletter at the beginning of the month. Uh, beginning of March that will give you all the details that you'll need and um, thanks again everyone for joining uh, enjoy the rest of your day